Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. This afternoon's briefing is on the topic of how can the federal government help prepare local communities for natural disasters. In this afternoon's briefing, we're going to be led through a discussion of the recommendations and the dialogue that occurred as a result of a task force that had been organized uh, at the behest of the White House entitled the State, Local, and Tribal Leaders Task Force on Climate Preparedness and Resilience. This bipartisan task force was comprised of 26 governors, mayors, tribal leaders, and other officials who spent a year compiling recommendations on how the federal government could best provide the kind of responsive assistance that local communities felt that they needed in order to be more resilient to the impacts of climate change that they were already seeing as well as those that are being projected. Throughout that year process that this task force came together, met, uh, and then compiled a report, and they came forward with more than 500 recommendations, which they then whittled down to about 35 very specific recommendations. Throughout this whole thing, at different times, we had occasion to be in conversation with uh, gubernatorial offices, as well as a couple mayors who had spoken at EESI briefings on resilience topics last year. Throughout this process, I was always struck by the great seriousness and dedication that these state and local leaders were bringing to this very important topic because of what they saw as the very real impacts that they were already dealing with, their concerns about how best to protect their citizens, their communities, um, public health and, and property and businesses and their local economies in terms of dealing with the kinds of disasters that, um, that they had been experiencing. And as we know, I think over 47 states had, have had um, presidentially declared national disasters in the last couple years. And so this is something that is very real, um, that people at the local level in terms of state and local leaders are having to deal with in very real time. And of course, the greater the amount of tools and knowledge and experience that they have and that they can glean from their peers, it means the more effective that people can be in terms of really protecting and making their communities much more resilient to these kinds of natural disasters. So we are going to hear from um, three people who were very involved throughout this year-long task force uh, exercise, and they are now very much involved in terms of working with their, with their colleagues and their um, elected leaders in terms of the implementation and execution of a number of these recommendations. And uh, we will first hear from Sam Ricketts, who is the director of the Washington office of the governor of Washington State, uh, uh, office. Uh, so Sam is the director of Governor Jay Inslee's uh, DC office here, where he is Governor Inslee's chief liaison with Congress, uh, with federal agencies, and the National and Western Governors Associations. He advises the governor and Washington state agencies with regard to federal policy as it affects Washington state and works on federal action for those, for the governor's federal policy. Uh, priorities. Before serving with Governor Inslee, uh, he, Sam also was the executive director of the U.S. House Sustainable Energy and Environmental Coalition called SEEK, which is a caucus that had been formed by then Congressman Jay Inslee and Congressman Steve Israel to promote clean energy and climate action. Sam? Thank you very much, Carol, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Carol, for putting on this event. Thanks for all for being here to discuss this important topic, and uh, and thanks to EESI for its always excellent work. I look forward to, to participating. 
So just a, a quick note um, about myself and my work. I, I'm Governor Inslee's Washington, D.C. office guy. I'm, his, I'm, I'm the governor's uh, uh, federal-facing liaison out here based in Washington, D.C., handling federal affairs for, for the governor and for state government, at the inter sitting at the intersection of, of federal policy as it impl impl affects the state and, and vice versa. <clears throat> Um, I, in this role, I, I participated as, as one of Governor Inslee's uh, 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 primary points on the, on the climate task force that the, the president convened, and I'll say a word about that uh, in a second. Um, quick, quickly, a background on the, the White House climate task force of the recommendations we're going to discuss, discuss today. Uh, the, the genesis of this came out of the, the president's climate action plan that he, of course, announced in the summer of 2013. Uh, was was to set up this task force that that led to a November 2013 executive order creating the task force, uh, and that led into the selection of members in that fall in the first meeting, December 2013. As Carol mentioned, there were 26 members on the task force: eight governors, 14 mayors, a couple of tribal officials, and a couple of county officials from all over the country, uh, all with very and varying degrees of. Uh, varying pr perspectives on uh, climate resilience, all with varying perspectives on how climate change is impacting their jurisdictions, but all with a very real appreciation for climate change uh, being a reality and very much affecting their jurisdictions. Um, it was a it was a fascinating exercise, as Carol mentioned. Uh, it was a year long deliberation that the officials met four different times, twice here in D.C., once in Iowa and once in L.A., and talked through a world of different recommendations and ideas they had for how the federal government could do a better job. That The charter of the task force was to have uh, these officials give re direct recommendations to federal agencies on better ways they can promote investments, programs, regulations that better take into account resilience and help states and locals themselves better uh, prepare for and build resilience to climate change. Um, and as I mentioned, each of these jurisdictions is dealing with this. It, this wasn't a an abstract um, or, or uh, overly academic. I mean, it was certainly a, a comprehensive exercise, but it wasn't an abstract exercise. These these are officials who are dealing with uh, public safety, uh, emergency preparedness, wildfire response, um, uh, disease control, uh, zoning laws, infrastructure uh, vulnerabilities, and they're all already seeing climate change impact and have pretty serious costs in their jurisdiction. So they all come to the table and say, hey, we've got these costs we've got to deal with. We've got these outdated regulations we need we need to have be more flexible to, to climate change. Uh, and it made for a very, very, very interesting series of discussions. Uh, and I think it, it in what ended up being a, a, a terrific uh, work product. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I, I think uh, there was initially 500 recommendations that were boiled down into to 35 concrete recommendations with some sub-recommendations under each. Um, and those recommendations fit into seven themes throughout the, throughout the document uh, and, and are organized under, under sort of five uh, guiding principles that, that you'll see uh, uh, inculcated throughout each of them. I, I, I really encourage everyone to, to take a look at this. We're going to yeah, each of us talk about various elements of these of the recommendations that came out, but by and large, we're, we're not going to get a chance to dive through the entire document, and I really do for policymakers and for those uh, here in D.C. and in the states and in and local government to take a look at, at, at this document and what it, what it can provide. I think that federal agencies are doing a very good job now working to implement these recommendations, um, but it, this, is a, this is a policy roadmap, and I, I encourage all of you to, to take a deeper dive into these pieces. There are You could spend a lot of time with just each one of these recommendations, figuring out the various different ways that it can and should be implemented. Um, a, a quickly word about climate change impacts in, in the Evergreen State, the state of Washington. Um, we are already experiencing pretty serious and, and economically and environmentally devastating uh, climate change impacts in the state of Washington. Uh, a, a few of them, uh, the, 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 these costs of which are, have already been projected to, to exceed about $10 million a year to the state economy by 2020. Uh, a few of them, uh, wildfires are, are, are becoming more devastating each fire season. Last year we had our worst wildfire in state history. Um, uh, wildfires are, are, are anticipated to, to burn about twice as many acres as they do annually right now in the state of Washington uh, by, by the 2020s and, and maybe quadruple the, the acreage by the 2040s. I mean, it's pretty, pretty uh, serious direct impacts from, from wildfires. Uh, water supply and, and flooding, Washington state is interesting in that uh, we're, we're, the state is, is bisected by the Cascade Mountains and on the, on the west side of the, of the state, it's, 
it's very wet. You all know about Seattle and rain. Um, uh, we're actually going to be seeing increasing precipitation on the west side of the state. So we're going to see increased flooding. We're already seeing increased flooding. We've already got communities who've been dealing with flooding for a long time. are going to be seeing more of it. Um, we're going to be seeing more mudslides. We're going to be seeing, you, you all recall, a, a very serious and very devastating, very tragic mudslide last, uh, last spring in, um, in, in Oso in, Sno in Snohomish County, Washington. Um, we're, we're going to be seeing all sorts of issues that, that come with, with greater precipitation uh, on the west side of the state, while the, on the east side of the state, traditionally the dry, arid side of the state, it, it's only going to get more so. Uh, the, the, the projected declines in Cascade snowpack are going to lead to uh, water supply problems, um, and uh, that, that could have, of course, that as you've seen this year in, in California and Nevada, it's having all sorts of impacts on agriculture, municipal water supply, um, and, and the like. Uh, also, we, we've got a robust shellfish industry in the state of Washington. We've got a great coastline. We've got the, uh, the country's first or second largest estuary, depending upon how you measure it, in Puget Sound. Our shellfish industry is, is responsible for about $270 million in economic activity uh, uh, in the state each year, and increasing acidity levels in, in our coastal waters are actually already having pretty significant impacts on our shellfish industry. We've had shellfish growers have to move oyster larvae growing operations out of the state. We had, we had some relocate to Hawaii because in parts of Puget Sound, the oysters are not actually able to form their shells because the acidity levels are too high. I'm actually wearing an oyster shell on my lapel here today. Um, uh, that's, that's, a direct, that's a direct economic impact from climate change that we've, that we've got to start getting around. And ocean acidification is an issue that I think all three, or Washington and California certainly prioritized in their membership on the task force and others did as well. Um, certainly, Washington State Governor Inslee feel we need to take action on climate change, both on resilience, but also obviously on reducing the emissions that are, the greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change. Uh, we've also had a history of leadership on resilience in the state. Um, our State Department of Ecology in 2012 published a comprehensive statewide strategy for um, oceans, uh, for, uh, for climate change resilience. Our, our State Department of Transportation, using federal uh, grant money, has actually has conducted a, a statewide evaluation of, of uh, uh, vulnerabilities from climate change to our transportation assets. Uh, our, our emergency management department has, been, has had eyes on this. And then a number of our local communities, City of Seattle, is a, has been a leader at the municipal level on climate resilience. Uh, so, we, so we came to this with a lot of background. Our, our intention was to share a lot of what we've done and what we know, what we've, what we've learned in our efforts with our, with our sister states and cities and also with the federal government to better uh, shape federal policy. So bringing to the table a, a series of priorities. One, um, and, and I think, again, I just stated this, but I want to restate it. I think the first most important federal policy action that needs, must be taken right now on climate change is to reduce the carbon pollution that is driving it. We can build all sorts of resilience capacity. We can re adapt all we want. Ultimately, uh, at the pace of, of emissions right now, we're not going to be able to adapt enough. Um, it, it's, it, we, need to, we need to cut the thing off at the, at the problem. So uh, looking at ways to reduce carbon, carbon pollution while also looking at resilience is, is vitally important. And I know the governor and, and our team tried to focus also on ways that we could do both. There's a series of strategies that have dual benefits. Uh, you can, by, by building more distributed, cleaner, solar, uh, cleaner energy systems, using combined heat and power, using solar, uh, you can actually have a more resilient grid, like we saw in, in New York City and other parts of New Jersey when uh, Superstorm Sandy came through. But you've also, you're building cleaner energy systems, which are not polluting as much. Uh, you can have better forest management practices that are um, helping to prevent wildfires and the great carbon and, and other pollutant runoff, uh, other pollutant uh, emissions that, that come from those fires while also helping to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so we also, we've got, uh, uh, we prioritize making sure that, that local and state governments have uh, tools and resources and coordination that they need with the federal partners to be able to continue to build on their resilience efforts and I'll get to more of that in a second. Uh, we've, we talked about promoting more resilient investments versus investing in things that are no longer contributing to resilience. And then we, again, prioritized a focus on ocean acidification. Uh, I think states each broadly, and I, I mentioned each jurisdiction has slightly different problems, but numerous different states brought uh, various different uh, ideas to the table. Uh, Vermont had all sorts of really instructive lessons learned from its response and recovery from, from Hurricane Irene. Maryland has been doing wonderful work with sea level rise and, and storm surge 
uh, and, and, and their statewide policy making. Uh, uh, Hawaii and actually the territory of Guam both came to the table with very important uh, uh, recommendations for that are unique, obviously, to, to islands in the Pacific, so, you know, some of which are, are pretty darn low to sea level. Um, so again, getting quickly, specifically to the recommendations, I don't kind of want to go over these quickly and, and talk about some of the, the main principles, the overarching themes, and then some of the specifics and where, where agencies stand and where they're going next. And I know my colleagues will likely expand upon these as well. I get five overarching principles that are inculcated throughout this. One, require consideration of climate risks and vulnerabilities in, in all federal policies and practices. Seems like a, a significant undertaking, and it is. Seems like it also is, should be common sense, and it is. Um, so that, that, is, that is an overarching principle. Uh, two, and I spoke to this, maximizing opportunities for dual benefits, climate resilience and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, three, strengthen coordination and partnerships between federal agencies who are doing various siloed things on climate resilience, but also between federal agencies and with states and locals. Uh, there's, there's still strong bridges to be built there. Uh, provide actionable data and information on climate impacts and related tools and we'll get to the, the, the definition of actionable in a little bit, and then consult and cooperate uh, with tribes, which is a, a vital piece of this. Tribes are uh, tribal nations uh, throughout Washington, throughout the country, have, are uniquely uh, are uniquely vulnerable to climate change. So quickly, does seven main themes of the recommendations, and I'll try and just give a quick example of each. Uh, one, building resilient communities, in, incorporating climate change considerations into traditional programs to rethink their approach. Uh, a good example is, is to develop and, and encourage adoption of resilience standards and in, siting and design of, of buildings and infrastructure. Should at least be done. I, the federal government itself can lead the way as a, as a first mover there. Two, imp improving resilience of infrastructure, um, climate smart, coastal and water infrastructure, use of green infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned clean energy systems. Uh, by, by having the federal government remove some of the roadblocks to property assess clean energy financing. We can, we, again, build some of those. You tap into uh, a private, private investment to build some more uh, uh, distributed and cleaner and resilient energy systems. Uh, ensuring the, the resilience of, of natural resources, natural resources are obviously uh, vital to the environments and public health in our state and also just uh, particularly in the state of Washington, we have the best and most beautiful natural resources. Uh, we need to protect those, and they have their own economic benefits. Uh, we need to combat invasive species, uh, integrated watershed management that looks at the whole river system, looks at the whole estuary, and not just a piece of it. Um, number four, preserving human health and supporting resilient populations. A good example is building on CDC's Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. Again, there's already good authorities and programs out there that need to be further invested in or built upon. Uh, five, supporting climate smart mitigation and disaster preparedness efforts. Uh, as I mentioned, some of I mentioned some of the disasters and hazards that are facing the state of Washington. Each state and local jurisdiction probably has a little different, unique uh, hazards facing them that are that are being furthered by climate change, but we need to remove barriers to, to rebuilding smarter, in a smarter way. I know Vermont had great examples of, of federal barriers they ran into when they tried to rebuild from Irene in a more climate smart way, and they couldn't because FEMA was telling them that wasn't compliant with the Stafford Act. Um, six, understanding and acting on, on the economics of resilience. There's a, there's a number of partners who need to be involved and deep, more deeply engaged. The insurance industry is, is an example of one of them who has been engaged and the federal government can better collaborate with them. Seven, and finally, building resi uh, capacity for resilience. Uh, give states and locals better info, or, or, or maybe not give them better info, help them have the resources to better understand info that's out there or to create the information themselves, and I'll, I'll touch on this. Um, now we're again shifting to implementation. I just gave you just a very brief overview of the overall recommendations. I do encourage everyone to, to, to dive into the, the document itself. Uh, CEQ is leading implementation. They're, they're the, they've been the driving force on the, on the report, and they're, they're the driving force with federal agencies on implementation. Each individual agency has been, or, or a number of them have, have been tasked with pursuing implementation of pieces that, that uh, they're falling under their jurisdiction, and they're obviously also having these conversations through the Federal Interagency Climate Resilience Task Force. Um, uh, but a few of the pieces that have been particularly of note, last week FEMA announced that 
uh, states from, from here out need to sub consider climate change as a part of their state hazard mitigation plan. Every state submits to FEMA a hazard mitigation plan that needs to be approved. Uh, until now, only I think about 11 or 12 states that actually incorporated climate change considerations into their, uh, into their plans. FEMA is saying that's, that's not good enough anymore. Again, this, this seems like common sense, and it is, but people hadn't been doing it. So FEMA's uh, FEMA, with the urging of this task force, is now making that official. Uh, 2CEQ is finally moving to, to finalize the, um, the uh, guidance that it, it, it had been working on for some years on how uh, federal agencies need to incorporate climate change impacts and also greenhouse gas emissions from projects under NEPA review, under review under the National Environmental Policy Act. Again, it seems to make sense that the country's overarching national environmental policy, NEPA, which has been around since the early 1970s, should incorporate climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions in its reviews, but again, it wasn't in place. And so now CEQ is moving to finalize that guidance, which I think they should be doing in, in the coming months. Um, Again, at the urging of, of Governor Inslee and at the urging of this task force. Uh, HUD is, is out with this national climate resilience or national disaster resilience competition, a billion dollar opportunity for states and, and counties to take advantage of as they seek to look at past disasters and build resilience towards future disasters, particularly with an eye towards climate change. There are other pieces of this, um, particularly in the West, the WGA at, at, at Governor Inslee's urging and, and stemming from this task force also is, is taking a look at wildfires. We've, you know, Western states are being eaten alive by wildfires, not just in Washington, but across the West. And we're increasingly talking amongst each other and with FEMA about looking at better ways that FEMA and federal agencies can provide support for recovery and response um, and long-term recovery for communities impacted by wildfires. Um, there's, but there's plenty more to be done. Um, most recommendations had an eye towards executive action. Uh, I think you can all appreciate why, but, but goodness knows there's plenty of work here. We, we are here in the Senate, and there's plenty of work uh, that Congress can be doing. Pl one thing is investment. Uh, a lot of the programs already exist, and they just need to be better funded. Uh, but Congress can play a, a vital role, again, in, in digging through this report and finding ways of, of furthering the work of, of the agencies or, or, or pushing agencies to do better on climate resilience. Um, one key thing that I want to get to, and I, was, I mentioned we talk about actionable, is is, is not rebuilding the wheel. And this was something that our team tried to, tried to bring to the table a lot through these conversations. We in the state of Washington have done a lot of work to invest in climate resilience and understanding how climate change is impacting the Evergreen State. We've created the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group, uh, which has been, which is a phenomenal group housed, in, in, again, in the state's, uh, one of the state's uh, public universities that has been understanding th these impacts and actually boiling down to a very specific level in counties and local jurisdictions about how climate change is impacting the state and its communities. Um, we, we, so we don't always just need there to be uh, new uh, platforms put forward, new hubs announced, but rather to uh, find better ways of understanding what the individual communities actually need and what, what influences their decisions on, on, on things that climate change would affect. And, and, and then meet the, meet the needs and help people understand how they can use these tools. Um, so, I, that, you know, so what is actionable? You know, and, and I think that's, that's the, the point of the, of, the, of the task force in this report is, is figuring out what, what local communities are actually going to need in order to build community resilience plans or in order to simply make better decisions about well, where to, where to, how, to, how to site zones and how to, how to prepare for climate change. Um, it's better info. I think we still need better info on what info local communities and states are, are, are looking for, uh, but that is a, a, a top-down as well as a, a, a bottom-up partnership. Uh, again, looking at current authorities, there are a host of programs that are already out there that can be tweaked or worked better. The Stafford Act and FEMA, the Coastal Zone Management Act, um, and that, that can be used or expanded upon to, to work to better address climate change. And then uh, more education. We need to get out there. We need to, we need to be talking with you know, the federal government is, is a great liaison through each of its agencies of getting into the communities of whether it's uh, executive leadership of state agencies, of, of municipal agencies, of, of county agencies, and explaining, hey, this is, this is the climate impacts that are coming to your region. Uh, if you want to know which ones are coming to your particular town, we should probably have a longer conversation. But, you know, start getting wise on this stuff because it's coming, it's already here in many places, and it's becoming very costly. So um, this has been a terrific undertaking. I know the governor was, was very appreciative of the opportunity to serve on the president's task force. I think it provided us with the opportunity to learn a lot from our sister states, and, and, and we hope vice versa. Um, we, now we look forward to continuing to work with the federal agencies on, on continued implementation of the recommendations. So thank you, Carol. Thanks, everyone, for being here.
we're now going to turn to Dr. Jennifer uh, Gerardo, who is the Director of Environmental Planning and Community Resilience for Broward County, Florida. Uh, Dr. Arado was uh, deeply involved in helping with the staffing of this task force uh, and in supporting uh, uh, elected uh, members from uh, the four county area with which he's been specifically working in Florida. Dr. Arado is responsible for the development and administration of countywide environmental programs and climate resiliency initiatives for Broward County, uh, Florida specifically. Uh, and within that, primary focal areas include regional climate mitigation and adaptation, water resource policy, planning and management, shoreline protection, and marine resources conservation and management. Since joining Broward County in 2002, Jennifer has worked on and has overseen multi-jurisdictional initiatives focused on water resource protection, alternative water supply planning, and the development of advanced hydrologic models and comprehensive planning efforts with an emphasis on climate resilience and adaptation planning for sea level rise. Now, I wanted to go through and read each of these issue areas because they are all areas that were very important to the task force, and obviously they are very important to the area that Jennifer um, is working in in Florida. She also played a lead role in the creation of the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, which is a four-county commitment to work regionally on climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. And this has been going on for a while because of the concerns from local leaders about what they were seeing in southeastern Florida and the need to address it. And in fact, I wanted to call to your attention um, an article that was in the front section of the Washington Post today, which is really discussing this four state compact, regional compact in Florida and why it exists and some of the actions that are being taken and the concerns of, of local citizens um, that, that this compact is really trying to address. And what was so important was all of the information and experience that people working on this compact were able to feed in to this task force. Um, because while Southeast Florida is dealing with some very unique and special problems, some of them are also being seen other places and they also bring a whole lot of experience with regard to having to think about how to best plan it and manage these kinds of really difficult situations. So let's now turn to Jennifer. Thank you, Carol, very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to participate in this important panel conversation. Um, I'll admit that my role really was a support role to our former Broward County Commissioner, Kristen Jacobs, who's been a tremendous um, advocate for um, climate resiliency initiatives, and I had a great pleasure of working with her for a number of years. She was the um, co-chair of the Built Systems Work Group to the task force, and uh, so we provided direct staffing um, to the activities there that included transportation, water, energy, built environment, and we uh, later added a, a sector that was specifically coastal infrastructure because we felt that the um, unique circumstances of our coastal communities really warranted a very focused um, discussion in that area. Um, and, and we, we um, took significant ownership of that particular issue. But we also had the benefit of coming into the task force process, again, with, with many years of real active engagement and um, an acknowledgement of how difficult it had been to arrive at the point that we were. I think that we, collectively we feel as if we really um, have gained great advantage from federal partnerships and from regional collaborations that have allowed us to accelerate our planning process. But we've also uh, appreciated that there's a, a very significant uh, divide to overcome when you're moving from the general policy concepts and planning initiatives to the true types of investments that need to take place in our communities in order to begin to realize the benefits of climate resiliency. And uh, so we had that perspective to share, and I think it was um, one that was also really well articulated by many of the members of 
uh, the working group and task force itself as they we were all at kind of varying levels of readiness and really appreciating the very importance of federal leadership, particularly in communities where we may not have, um, in South Florida, we've got very strong engagement in Southeast Florida, but we may not have that same engagement at the state level, and thus the types of recommendations that would come from the task force uh, report could end up providing very strong incentives and um, perhaps some baseline information that could begin to elevate all of our communities uh, across our state and across our country, not just those that had had the advantage of early um, participation and action. So what I'd like to do is begin by just kind of telling a little bit of the uh, South Florida circumstance because as Carol was um, expressing this has um, been a reality that has been well observed by our residents, by our business leaders, by our elected officials um, both um, Democrat and Republican and our initiatives have been um, very uh, reflective of bipartisan collaborations within our counties and across the four county region. Um, for a little bit of orientation, Broward County is just north of Miami, uh, in Miami-Dade County. I know most tend to focus on the very southern port uh, tip of our, our state, but we're Broward in the middle of the, the two larger counties there. We have a coastline of about 23 miles. We have a population of about 1.8 million. We have 25 water utilities, about an equal number of wastewater treatment facilities. We've got an international port, an airport. The port has about $20 billion in uh, economic activity in a year. The beach and our coastal resources support another $10 billion in economic activity. Three feet of sea level rise. We have about $6 billion in infrastructure that is vulnerable. We we have about 30% of our landscape at an elevation of five feet or less, and we're very densely developed and we're squeezed or sandwiched between two very important natural systems, the Everglades to our west, which is protected and is not an area of retreat, and of course our coastal waters to the east. So it's a very unique environment with very significant vulnerabilities by virtue of our uh, landscape and our, top, our topography. We also have another kind of confounding factor, which is 1,800 miles of canals that provide drainage and flood control for our community. So the entire functionality of that system is dependent on the ability to move water with gravity from west to east. And as sea level rises, we have the reduced capacity for discharges to the east. And that means that climate resilience and issues of sea level rise are not just isolated to the coastal fringe, but they translate across our entire community with um, very significant flood and water supply implement, um, implications. And the other element that I, I would like to raise early as well is that it's not just a matter of sea level rise influences as we look at storm surge or overtopping of seawalls, and I'll share some of those pictures, but it's also about water coming up from beneath our feet because our geology is very porous, it's limestone. We don't have a granite or basalt you know, foundation that keeps seawater at bay. We're actually seeing rises in groundwater elevations in our coastal areas. We've seen more than a foot rise in groundwater elevation. And when you only have five feet of uh, separation between your surface and your groundwater, that's your flood protection. So you're losing 20% you know, of the flood protection with a foot of sea level or groundwater rise beneath our feet. And, uh, and it has implications for water supply. So I'll share with you some of these graphics. And I know that many have observed the, you know, the images of high tide events, but you can truly see how dramatic this is. There is absolutely no distinction between a waterway and your roadway. This is the type of uh, flooding that occurs multiple times a, a year for um, several days at a time. Uh, this last year, high tide events started early. We saw them in August running all the way through December. This causes water to backflow into people's homes up through the sanitary sewer systems as there's a massive inflow in through the plumbing. There's massive inflow through stormwater infrastructure. Communities that are not immediately adjacent to waterways have the same vulnerabilities. We see backflow through for this type of uh, stormwater infrastructure that's designed to move rainfall off the landscape, it ends up serving as a mechanism whereby tidal waters can flow inland. So this is saltwater flooding on a piece of property that is not waterfront. And we also have um, communities that can be several miles inland, as happened two years ago with a nominal rainfall event. They have no, I assure you, no waterfront property within any usable distance, and yet they had massive flooding, two feet of standard 
expanding water on their landscape as a result of a high tide because there was simply no movement in the stormwater infrastructure and it all accumulated in these basins. So this um, interconnection of water management infrastructure is what keeps our community dry, but it's also what keeps, makes the community vulnerable under sea level rise. The issues also relate to extreme weather events. Uh, we get a lot of rainfall in South Florida, about 58 inches a year, but we can't hold it all. We're built out, we're flat, we don't have major reservoirs, we don't have the storage capacity. So flooding is a real issue, and increasingly we're seeing major events, one in a hundred year events, one in 500 year events. Last year, we had two one in a thousand year rainfall events in the state of Florida. One was in Palm Beach County, 14 inches of rain in three hours people, um, you know, loss of life with drowning. We had, it, in the Palm Beach example, it was 22 inches of rain in a day. And obviously that's, um, it's about a, 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 you know, a fifth of the rainfall that we would generally receive in the entire year and it can't be used. Where we don't have adequate pumps to move 18 inches of rain in a day, we have had standing flooding as in the la picture on the left, two weeks that this um, community looked like that. And in the city of Hollywood, this picture, this was flooding overnight. People went in to uh, their girlfriend's home for a, a book reading uh, a club and they came out and their cars had washed down the street. And these are happening increasingly during the dry season when it's not supposed to be raining. And, and this is more characteristic of the type of condition you'd expect in a tropical storm. We're also seeing increased impacts to infrastructure. South Florida did not have a direct hit from Sandy, but the onshore prevailing winds coupled with extreme high tide eroded uh, the beaches, so we didn't have any buffer when the next winter storm came through that consisted of onshore winds and high tide and overnight we had four uh, blocks of A1A which is an emergency evacuation route uh, collapse and the restoration of this project was about 24 million dollars just four blocks and we did end up building back with resiliency we raised the road we pushed the road back we reduced the number of lanes uh, we created additional buffers we put in beach dunes all of the, uh, the, the necessary elements of resiliency when you're trying to maintain an emergency evacuation route, but it really did underscore the type of impacts that we see with rising seas. And we've experienced about um, nine inches of sea level rise in South Florida in the last 90 years. This next picture shows uh, an issue that relates to water supply, and this is something that, it, that individuals, many individuals are not cognizant of regularly because miraculously water just arrives at our homes. But in Broward County, um, we have a severe issue relating to saltwater intrusion. Many will argue, well, that's because you've overutilized the resource, but it's really not the case. I mean, clearly there are significant water demands that have contributed to that over the time. But our withdrawals from the aquifer, the aquifer have been uh, capped since 2006. We have partnered with the USGS in very advanced hydrologic modeling to ascertain the amount of saltwater intrusion that's attributed to sea level rise. It's accelerated the movement by about a factor of two. And um, based upon the unified sea level rise projection that we've collectively agreed to use in our region for planning purposes, we anticipate that we will lose about 35 million gallons per day of water supply capacity by about 2060. That's about 40 percent of our coastal capacity, and that's important because all of the treatment facilities associated with that water supply um, you know, they're adjacent to the sources. So this, um, this type of um, issue requires it's between 300 and 400 million dollars to rectify if we're able to count on the same water source being available. If we're moving to alternative water supplies, it's quite a bit more uh, costly. And so we're looking at uh, regional water initiatives to help address that type of vulnerability, but it's also important in our conversations to recognize that while that's the reality in 2050, it's a gradual eroding of capacity. We don't lose the wells overnight, and we don't um, you know, have the flooding impacts only realized at a future point in time. It's a gradual eroding of drainage capacity, water supply capacity, increased storm events that all create these additional vulnerabilities. And it's not just Broward. We share a common landscape with Southeast Florida. And we began to appreciate the magnitude of, of investments that were being made across our communities that led all four of our counties to come together with the determination to share the expertise, share the investments, develop more robust planning tools and strategies than if we were working individually. 
and also ideally position ourselves better for partnerships with the federal government because we knew that those resources couldn't come down and, and benefit each of the 110 cities in our four county area, but with four counties with a population of nearly six million, we account for a third of our state's economy. It was more of a, um, a, you know, a pressing and prominent voice calling for uh, resource support. We agreed to uh, collaborate in climate and energy policy at the state and federal levels to develop common planning tools such as the unified sea level rise projection and vulnerability maps and so forth to inform our planning decisions, also greenhouse gas emissions inventories. Um, we agreed to develop a regional action plan, which was uh, produced. It was finalized in 2012. It's been adopted by all four of our counties unanimously by our bipartisan boards. It's been um, embraced by our cities, about a third of our cities in the four-county area. And this is Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, and Monroe County. Monroe is the Florida Keys. Um, they formally signed on with support for the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, implementation of the action plan, and even more cities are actually implementing the recommendations and participating, even though maybe a resolution has not been adopted. And then the fourth area of collaboration has been annual hosting of climate summits. And then in, in those um, uh, situations, we have elected leadership from all four of the counties, our city managers, business communities, environmental interests, academic partners, all come together for this comprehensive conversation about what's happening in our environment, how is planning being advanced, and what needs to happen next. And we rotate those conversations uh, in terms of who, who we, each of the counties that's hosting and participating. And as a result of working together, we've been able to maximize benefits. Um, we have benefited with the USGS, the Department of Energy, EPA, they're all detailed here, that have brought technical expertise to our processes. But it isn't just what's happening in the four counties. We know it's a strong alignment with our federal agency and state partners and then the implementation at the local level where so much of the um, investments need to be made. And that's really where the task force report comes into play. We know that we've been able to gain significant advantage because of the partnerships that have been enjoyed. Many of our communities have not had that same benefit. They don't have the resources. They don't know where to start. They don't know what's the best data. And so much of this conversation was how can we use the federal expertise and the investments and the competency that's available, bring it back to local governments, bring actionable and scalable information. We can't just use the uh, projections from the National Climate Assessment. What does it mean in my community? And then one of the other conversations was, well, the federal government clearly can't be in all places at all times. How can we incentivize regional participation and collaborations? And since then, I think that we've seen a number of investments that are coming forward, initiatives and programs that are being structured and scaled to provide that type of incentive. Um, we've had um, the, uh, day, the climate data centers that were announced during this process designed to help bring um, actionable information to communities, support for agriculture. We had the Climate Action Champions Award that was announced that was clearly um, established to allow and, and encourage regional collaborations. It's really about also ensuring that, that the information that, that is being provided is, um, can help guide state policy as well. And it's not, it, while the, while the resources, resources are critical at the local level, local governments are also precluded from doing a great deal by virtue of state policy. So how can the federal government encourage states to take a more proactive stand and align their processes with the prog progressive planning and the type of accountability that's, um, you know, prevalent throughout the local governments, but needs to be more and better supported by um, all of the variety of uh, state investments. So the task force um, uh, report and the recommendations that we've seen evolve as of late, including the flood standards, are very important. We've expressed support for those flood standards, for the clean carbon rule, for natural systems infrastructure that's um, advanced by uh, uh, principles advanced by the EPA, the NEPA um, guidance um, that, that incorporates climate mitigation and adaptation are all critical mechanisms for ensuring that climate resiliency is part of programs, that federal programs are expanded to, to directly support and require climate resilient investments, and that they're broadened in a manner that are more responsive and modern to the types of challenges that we're realizing today, that there's a great deal that needs to be um, enhanced. So we look forward to um, continuing to see the rollout of the executive orders that are supporting implementation of the recommendations. They were clearly 
um, advanced out of a, a great need and a realization that the federal government has a uh, responsibility and local governments have a need for those um, for the expertise and partnerships that will collectively advance resiliency and protect our communities and our economies and hopefully South Florida serves as a really good model of, um, of, of how we can be more effective in, in working at those um, levels and scales of collaboration through local government and state and federal. Thank you. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad you're there working on all of this because that situation looks already very, very overwhelming in terms of the challenges uh, that are having to be dealt with by, um, by local communities and their leadership. So we're now going to turn to another representative of local government, to Carolyn Burnt, who is the Program Director for Sustainability at the National League of Cities, where she is um, uh, a part of the federal advocacy team leading NLC's advocacy regulatory and policy efforts on energy and environmental issues that include water infrastructure and financing air and water quality, climate change, and energy efficiency. And of course, the National League of Cities is the oldest and largest organization representing municipal governments. The, the task force included several mayors, including uh, Mayor Ralph uh, Becker, who is the mayor of Salt Lake City and who is also uh, the current president or chairman of the National League of Cities. And so there were, um, uh, as I said, several mayors that were part of the task force, including the leadership of NLC. And Carolyn is going to speak to us a little bit more specifically about what the task force recommendations, what dealing with, with uh, resilience and preparation means for local governments, for cities. Thanks, Carol, and uh, happy to be here today, and thank you all for joining us. Um, yes, uh, as Carol mentioned, NLC works, uh, we serve as a resource and advocate for about 19,000 cities and towns. We work through uh, 49 state municipal leagues, um, and uh, representing really about 218 million Americans. Uh, sustainability is one of the key issues for NLC, both in federal advocacy and in our research team. Um, where we have the NLC Sustainable Cities Institute with um, best practices, model poli policies and ordinances and research on the various topics within sustainability. Um, so uh, really, as we've, as we've heard, you know, local governments are seeing the effects of climate change and extreme weather, and they're taking action. And of course, there are regional differences to the impacts. Um, here you have the you know, two extremes on water quality and supply. Uh, we know climate change will exacerbate existing water challenges and create new challenges for local governments and communities. Um, local governments are leading the way uh, on energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure, water management. We really need the uh, federal support uh, to amplify these programs, and that's where the recommendations come in. Um, specifically, I think uh, broadly, um, local governments are looking for help with capacity building, uh, help with regional coordination and planning, um, disaster planning and response, and resources and tools and data to help with vulnerability assessments, decision making, developing and implementing long-term mitigation, adaptation, resilience plans. Um, and so why do local governments care about the task force recommendations? Local governments are the first responders to emergency situations. They prepare in advance of emergencies, they respond to those in need, and they're there for the recovery process. I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about um, three of the cities that were represented on the task force, uh, Houston, Fort Collins, and Salt Lake City. Um, I'm going to give a little bit about what each of these cities are doing and kind of what uh, the recommendations um, you know, perhaps are most important. Uh, so Houston is a, a large community, about over six million projected to grow to 7 million by uh, 2020. Their main focus is on reducing greenhouse gas emissions as their population is going to increase. 
Um, their climate impacts, again, are the heat and drought, storms and floods. Um, so what are they doing? They're, they've replaced all their street lights with LEDs. They're focused on energy efficiency, improving the energy efficiency of buildings, um, growing their hybrid fleet, municipal fleet, uh, purchasing renewable energy for municipal buildings, uh, advancing electric vehicles and installing solar meters, uh, solar parking meters. They also have an aggressive um, bike sharing plan, a bike sharing system, and they've uh, started a comprehensive uh, bike plan, a study. And this is a um, $500 million public-private partnership where they're going to further build on their system of um, bike paths and trails, which I have a slide on in a minute. This is not only for recreation, but it's also about mobility. I mentioned reducing greenhouse gases. Obviously, the transportation is a key here. Oh, whoops, I forgot I had three on one slide. Um, Fort Collins is really a story about fire and flood. Um, there was a 2012 uh, High Park fire, which burned about 80,000 uh, acres, and that was really a precursor to the 2003 flood. Um, the fire changed their landscape around Fort Collins. Uh, it caused erosion since the fire. There's been increased erosion, debris flow, flash floods, and it destroyed their natural infiltration, infiltration system, which they had to spend $2 million to rebuild, to, to build a structure um, that was destroyed from the fire. So again, the disaster preparedness and recovery recommendations from the task force are really important here. Um, as was um, their peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, with the state of Vermont, um, which really they credit, the state and the city both credit with uh, helping to speed up the recovery process from the 2013 flood. But really, it was the lessons learned from the 1997 flood, which was a greater than 500 year event and incidentally, the 2013 flood was only a 50-year event. Um, lessons learned from that really helped them um, minim minimize the damage and the impacts. Um, and also, the building on that, a recommendation um, in the task force report on the resilience core, which would help smaller communities build capacity, both before, during, and after emergencies, providing on-the-ground support and technical assistance. Um, you may have seen in the news recently that Fort Collins uh, this month adopted an aggressive uh, climate action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2030, which is a full 20 years ahead of um, the other communities that are um, by hoping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by that much by 2050. They don't exactly know how they're going to get there. Um, I think there's a lot of technological advances that need to happen, but it's more than just a partnership with their utility. It's a community-wide effort. Um, and then finally, Salt Lake City. As Carol mentioned, uh, Mayor Becker is our president uh, this year of National League of Cities. And uh, he's been really engaged both in his community, very active in his community on these issues, and for NLC. Uh, there haven't been any major climate disasters in Salt Lake City, but nonetheless, they are doing vulnerability assessments and uh, strengthening their emergency planning and response. Um, this will reduce the risk to their citizens and minimize costs um, for any future events. So again, the pre-disaster training and response and recovery are essential. Uh, information from the federal government and data um, on flood hazard maps, wildfire risks, erosion ha hazards are all critical. Um, and they've also highlighted um, as key recommendation the value in considering the true economic costs in future climate risks in their decision-making process. Um, so taking into account the long-term benefits, not just the short-term costs. And this is true for them at the city level and also at the federal level. And I think this was mentioned before, but the federal grant, grants and programs considering climate change uh, is an important step. Okay, and then I just wanted to talk about um, two other recommendations that I think are really going to be critical for local governments. Um, the first one is PACE. Um, allowing policies, reforming policies to allow Fannie and Freddie to accept mor mortgages with PACE loans. 
I think this would be a game changer for cities, a game changer for energy efficiency, renewable energy. Uh, we know commercial PACE projects are thriving um, across the country. I think there's 13 states with active programs. Um, residential PACE is happening in California. The state was able to set up a, a loan loss reserve fund in a handful of other states. But this, you know, we, we know saves homeowners money, improves property values, stimulates the economy, and improves the housing market. Um, there's also a pilot program in California with HUD to look at PACE projects for multifamily housing. And I think this would have, if that program is successful, that could have positive implications for PACE programs nationwide. Um, and then the other recommendation I just want to highlight quickly is um, that of green infrastructure, supporting green infrastructure, incentivizing green infrastructure. Um, and here we have Chicago, this is obviously a green roof, but they're doing a green alley program. They're looking at their tree canopy and not only increasing their tree canopy, but um, looking at which trees are, are able to be planted in Chicago. And it's no longer the cold weather trees, but it's more of the southern trees that are warmer weather. Um, this has dual benefits, again, mitigating effects of increasing temperatures, uh, stormwater management, increasing energy efficiency, and lowering energy costs. And here's another green infrastructure project in Houston, um, a large-scale project, uh, the Houston Byways, the Bayou Greenways Initiative is, again, 220 million public-private partnership. Uh, to add 1,500 acres of new green space and um, 150 miles of trails to add to their 540 miles of existing bike trails. This is also a, a quality of life project. Um, you know, they did a benefit study and um, found the total measurable annual benefits of about 117 million. And not including all the benefits that you can't uh, readily calculate. But again, Houston's focused on air and water quality and um, reducing flooding and stimulating the economy all through the green infrastructure project here. Um, this is just another city, uh, Eugene, Oregon, where there's a fire and flood um, push and pull. Again, hazard mitigation, planning, disaster preparedness, emergency response, and vulnerability assessments, all looking at uh, the climate risk to the community. Okay, so cities can lead, cities will lead. Um, you know, whether you're, this is, this is kind of our, our theme as we're looking forward to the uh, UN negotiations uh, in Paris on the climate talk. Um, Cities will be at the center of the stage in this negotiations. We sent a delegation to Stockholm uh, six years ago, and it was really all about the national governments. Um, but this year, what we're seeing is that local governments are at the center stage. So what NLC is doing uh, with partners is pulling together all of these local stories in hopes that demonstrating that there's a collective commitment uh, to addressing climate change. I do have recommendations. Um, the administration is taking positive steps to implement the uh, recommendations of the task force. We expect and hope to see more in the next two years. Um, but there are important roles for Congress as well. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about tax exempt status for municipal bonds. It's the main source of funding infrastructure projects. Uh, without this, there will be local governments will pay more to finance projects leading to less infrastructure investments, fewer jobs, and greater burdens for those that have to pay higher taxes and fees. Um, we need more financing tools, not less, and we have to be smarter with what we have, especially in terms of uh, improving infrastructure and rebuilding our communities to be climate resilient. Um, and second, I want to mention uh, the Portman Shaheen bill. Um, a broad, comprehensive bill on energy efficiency, and uh, we are particularly supportive of the provision there that would allow um, uh, lenders and homeowners with more flexible underwriting standards to include the home's energy cost savings in mortgages. Um, and then finally, also uh, national policies that will really drive long-term investment and change uh, in local success. 
And uh, local governments are taking action, cities are taking action every day, and this will uh, save lives, strengthen local economies, save taxpayer dollars, and build preparedness for future events. Thank you. All right, so does anyone have any questions or comments for our presenters this afternoon? Okay, and please identify yourself, Terry. Thanks. <clears throat> Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. Is there any discussion about deep energy retrofits in any of these um, discussions? Um, deep energy efficiency retrofits. Carolyn, uh, do you know in terms of any particular city action on that front? Okay, I think it's on. It's on. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think cities are doing that as part of, you know, looking at their, bu their building stock, existing building stock, um, whether it's homes and commercial properties. Um, a lot of cities are engaged um, in the energy retrofits. And I think a, a big push on that came from the Energy and Conservation Block Grant um, that Congress funded through the uh, Stimulus Act. But, but yes, yes. Uh, and just from the state level as well, certainly uh, Washington State and a number of other states have a pretty, as I think as you know, pretty comprehensive and pretty significant energy efficiency retrofit programs throughout states. Um, I, I mean, one of the things we tried to highlight through the task force recommendations was was uh, was building more more efficient energy systems and taking less load off of uh, centralized systems and power plants that are that, that are vulnerable. To, uh, to cold weather snaps, to, to extreme weather events, uh, do, do function as a, as a good pathway towards resilience in addition to building out clean energy resources, if that, if that can partly answer your question. Um, from South Florida, I would just share that we really struggle um, with energy issues. Um, we're very supportive and progressive, I think. We've adopted renewable energy goals as our communities. We've supported PACE. We have um, many cities and counties that are participating in PACE despite the um, difficulties of, of, of the current FHFA position. Um, but we see challenges in the Florida C Supreme Court um, with respect to PACE in large part because of the, um, the federal position. Uh, in addition, we've had energy efficiency standards eliminated by our Public Services Commission for our uh, large um, energy utilities, and we've also had rebates for solar initiatives um, eliminated at both through the state program and we're in the final year of those that are being offered at the, um, at the, at the utilities, and, um, and uh, feed-in tariffs have been eliminated in some areas also. So again, standards that can be and incentives that are advanced at the federal level that will broaden opportunities, create opportunities and some flexibility for local communities that are ready to lead would be um, very attractive, but we're very hamstrung by state energy policy in our state. Um, that's really interesting in terms of sort of looking at that combination of circumstances. And then I had wanted to just also, ask all of you, um, I think, Carolyn, you raised it in terms of that there are a number of areas where cities, where local governments um, feel that they are hamstrung, well, and you just mentioned it in terms of the county level, too, by, by states. And I was curious in terms of whether, uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, like Governor Inslee, in terms of thinking about also some of his other colleagues on the task force, and in terms of some of the, the mayors, county commissioners, whether there is now going to be an effort to kind of look at how maybe some of your associations might sort of look at this whole issue and, you know, take that on a little bit more in terms of some of these barriers that where state policy is blocking local governments from being able to move forward. What's the, what's the best way forward on that? And do you see, like say, Western Governors or NGA uh, looking at that recommendation or is NLC or the Conference of Mayors or NACO going to sort of push in terms of say some of this, the gov gubernatorial um, associations? I was just curious. 
Um, uh, and the short answer is, is no, I don't think so. Uh, the longer answer is, um, uh, and this is a really good point that I think both my colleagues have, have drawn out, which is here, here I've talked about the things the state of Washington has done, is doing on climate resilience, um, which we think are, are, are progressive and are supportive of our local communities, our cities and our counties, who are, do, who are also doing really remarkable things, uh, forward-looking things on uh, every corner of the, of the state, um, blue, red, purple, and otherwise. Um, but there are a number of states who are very much not um, doing, doing these things. And, and as, as they've alluded to, um, uh, it's important to note that the, of the, the, the governors from states and territories that serve on the task force, there were eight of them, it was bipartisan representation. There were, there were seven Democratic governors and, and one Republican governor um, uh, from the territory of Guam. Uh, and, and we and, and and by and large the task force, which had also a number of, of Democratic and Republican mayors, um, as well as the county officials and tribal officials, uh, it, important to note that the, these efforts were bipartisan. And, and unfortunately, as we all know, a lot of the discussion around climate, both mitigation and unfortunately the resilience, and 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 which I, one could argue is just good government. Uh, unfor unfortunately, even the resilience has, has waded into the into the partisan discussion. So I you know I know that that there have been in, that. For instance, the NGA has been, uh, and this is not to disparage the NGA whatsoever, they have been very involved in understanding what these recommendations were, and we, and we have helped to try and disseminate the information to our colleagues. Um, various states, first of all, face various different climate risks, and second of all, there's various appetites uh, to undertake climate resilience activities, as we've seen in various states. Well, I would just say that, you know, perhaps one example um, is the EPA's Clean Power Plan. Uh, NLC did support that um, in terms of uh, local governments, helping, helping local governments able to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and obviously there are a number of, of states that are coming out opposed. So how this plays out, I don't know, but I think that states, cities are looking um, really to to be a part of that with the, with the energy efficiency programs that, that they are doing. So um, I think that's one area where we are seeing this conflict. Um, but again, it is also from the, the federal level as well. Mm -hmm. so. Other questions, comments? Okay, back here. Uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, you've kind of talked about this, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about where does this initiative come from for investment in preparedness? Is this our businesses calling for it? Is this local leaders taking leadership, um, community members? Who's pushing for this? Yeah, in, in South Florida, I would say that there's a, there's a strong, diverse base. Um, we have had the business community, for example, in the city of Miami Beach, it was the business community that really rallied to um, um, prompt the, the local leadership to be more aggressive on um, adaptation and resiliency issues. Um, we have seen calls for bringing together the business community, the insurance community, the finance industry to look at adaptation strategies, finance strategies, um, but there's also strong support from the homeowners who are realizing those impacts. We had one community where as a result of what was now this very chronic high tide flooding that they negotiated with the city to fund at a cost of about 300000 uh, retrofit of the stormwater uh, system with um, some technologies and that if that played out then the city would reimburse them and then utilize that as a more comprehensive strategy. So residents are looking for engagement. We've had business owners that have had $50,000 in flood loss with high tide repeated. Maybe it's in their business and in their residence. So I think collectively there's an appreciation that there needs to be these investments in infrastructure. That's the role of local government and, um, and, and every and there's a stronger appreciation that the avoided losses of those impacts are going to be a wise investment short and long term. Uh, Jennifer, could you talk a little bit more about the, the role of the insurance industry and, and, um, and how they are responding or what kinds of actions they're taking? 
Well, the, the, the insurance um, industry, largely the engagement has been through the reinsurance. And uh, obviously they've been um, undertaking very comprehensive risk assessments. We know that they've got extensive data sets and are well aware of what those um, risks are and, and climate impacts continue to escalate in terms of the um, potential losses. Um, in, in terms of the um, local insurance market, we... You know, Florida's insurance is quite different from others. We have um, very stringent um, windstorm requirements, and we have state underwritten, underwritten policies. So, I think I think that the the major influence is apt to come with the flood insurance. Of course, we saw the conversation that evolved with the Bigger Waters Act. Um, we're in the uh, we're, we're seeing modified flood maps that are showing enhanced risks in these very vulnerable areas. And individuals are starting to think about um, whether insurance will be affordable long term, will, the, um, will there be a market for that real estate long term. And I expect that the combination of losses and insurance rate hikes will end up being one of the um, drivers in terms of what happens to some of the more vulnerable communities even out absent, you know, the, the, the longer term predictions, there will, there will be some adjustments in the shorter term. And I was also interested in, to um, ask whether you are seeing a lot of people from uh, um, other counties within Florida that are coming um, to you to talk about the compact, yeah. you know, whether there's, whether you're getting a lot from other other states as well as within the state. There have been a lot of um, co collaborations internally and uh, with communities outside of our state. Um, there, uh, in, in the Jacksonville area, there's a business community that's leading on climate resiliency, and they've convened their own um, work group that's involving their Chamber of Commerce. So it looks like something akin to um, our compact could be evolving in the uh, Northeast. In the Tampa area, there seem to be conversations, too, about organizing um, regionally, and we've um, participated in a lot of conversations with communities nationwide that are all, uh, many are also looking at regional collaborations, but they, they have different structures based upon, you know, their own sure. geography and, and, and governance structures, and uh, so I, I think that it, um, that it's increasingly becoming evident that the, the challenges are too great to undertake individually, and there's a great deal of virtue that comes in sharing information, sharing experts. We don't have to replicate the same technical team across all the counties. We can share staffing, and there's an acceleration in process that comes. We have more robust work products. There's um, a, a greater tendency to be able to piggyback on the work products of others, and it's really allowed, and others I think have seen, um, that there's an acceleration that comes in, the, in, in planning and being able to also garner community support when you bring forward ideas that are reflective of a, a very um, a much larger geographic area and um, political commitment. Great, great. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, go ahead, Terry. <clears throat> The insurance industry has come up with its own uh, building codes. Um, Fortified, or what I think the name of the acronym is. Is, is are you seeing much of that deployed in Florida? The, the situation in Florida is, again, one in which we have very restrictive environment as it relates to building codes. In South Florida, we were successful in negotiating a very special part of building code for high wind um, velocity zone that includes Palm Beach and Broward counties. But there are restrictions on um, advancing building code and any energy code um, um, standards that would be more strict than the state standard. The state's building code lags about three years behind the federal building code. So I know there's this international building code that has many attractive measures. Um, and, I, and I believe that there, all in all there's a, 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 a movement to integrate a lot of that into the, the Florida code. Um, but there's a lag and, a, and, it, and it's, requisite, it's a requisite state process. Um, which is another issue that happens since a lot of these codes have to be approved at the state level. So, um, okay. I, are, let me just ask, are there any particular other points that any of you wanted to raise? 
as you look at this and as the recommendations move forward. Okay, terrific. And, um, and so I want to thank you all for coming. Hopefully you will all look at the task force report, think about what it could mean in terms of your local communities, um, if you're with a federal agency or in terms of thinking about state government. And th I think there was a fact sheet outside that basically summarizes the recommendations of the report. And I also want to remind everyone that on April 20th, we'll be holding a second briefing with regard to recommendations in the report, but that briefing will really focus on recommendations coming from uh, tribal leaders and looking at impacts, implications that, that they see, um, and with a special look at, at some of the situations that, tri uh, that um, uh, tribal leaders are dealing with in Louisiana and how they are planning to move forward. Uh, so I want to thank our panel um, very much for all of your hard work and all of the information that you gave us, which was a lot. So, and um, please feel free to um, take advantage of them because they're all wonderful resources and join me in thanking them all very much.